All right, everyone, it's going to get, uh, it's going to get real, uh, real quick today. I want to share with you a story, and the story that I share, some of you are going to say, Rick, I would just prefer you keep that story to yourself because you might feel a little bit grossed out. I hear that, but if that's the way that you feel, imagine what it was like for me being in that moment. Years ago, when I was in my mid-20s, uh, I was a youth pastor, and I wanted to take a group of high school students on a mission trip. They had never been on a mission trip before. And the kids who I was responsible for, uh, they were from a very rural community. So I took them to a very large city so that they could meet people and develop relationships and serve in an urban context. And they loved everything about the trip. I loved almost everything about the trip. One day, one of our assignments was to work with uh, a shelter and a drug rehab facility in downtown of the city that we were working in. And uh, that was great. And do you know what it's like? To, you're, you're in the front end of going to do something that's helpful and, and loving. And you, you know how exciting that is? You just kind of feel euphoric. You're excited to serve. You're excited to, to do something kind. You're excited to make a difference. All that came crashing down on me in a hurry. There we were. We were in the, we were in the shelter and the drug rehab facility. And they, do, they were fantastic people. And they did phenomenal work. And it was great to, to get to you know, just invest in that a little bit. I was assigned the task of cleaning. No problem. I was assigned the task of cleaning the men's bathroom. No problem. I walked in the men's bathroom. Problem. And you're wondering, what was, what was the problem? Did it smell? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there were smells. But the real problem was I walked in, went around the corner, and I saw it. I just saw it right there on the wall. Someone had taken human feces and just smeared it all over the wall in the bathroom that I'm supposed to clean. And I'm thinking to myself, why? Why would you do that? Kids, don't do drugs. It makes you do bad stuff. But there I was, I'm just standing in this bathroom, and I'm looking at this poop castle right there on the wall. And that's when I have a conversation with Jesus. Jesus, I know that you went to the cross for me. Jesus, I know you put up with all kinds of stuff in my life, but I don't want to do this. And I had a decision to make. Was I going to glove up and make a difference? Or was I going to back down and make excuses? You want to know what I did? I'm not going to tell you. Because I want you to think about, I want you to wrestle with, what would you do? And not just that scenario, really, I'm inviting you to wrestle down a question with me. I'm inviting all of us to wrestle this question down. It's this right here. How much mess is too much mess for you to mess with? I mean, where is the line? Now, let's put it in the context, not something that takes place in the bathroom. Let's put it in the context of relationships. Let's put it in the context of dealing with messes with people. When it comes to getting real and raw and vulnerable with people, where is the line for you? Where is it that you run up to the line and you say, you know, really, this is just too much and this is too messy? I, I don't want to make any assumptions about you. I don't want anybody to make any assumptions about me. But isn't it true that for every one of us, there is a line? And when we hit that line, we have to have a conversation with ourselves. Are we going to make a difference? Or are we going to make excuses? It's at this point in the message, if you've been tracking with us over the past several weeks, that we always turn to our base camp passage and we begin to, to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm not going to do that now. That's going to come up later in the message. But instead, I want to share with you what might be one of my top five favorite verses in the entire Bible. It comes from the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Check it out. Proverbs 14.4 says this, Where there are no oxen, the manger is empty, or, or the stable, the barn stays clean. But from the strength of an ox comes an abundant harvest. I love the Old Testament book of Proverbs. If you're not familiar with it, take your Bible, open it up to the middle, flip forward one book, and you are in Proverbs. It's a book full of wisdom. And so much of it is really the, it's the approach of a dad trying to pass on wisdom and insight to a son. Dads, how many of you out there have tried to have this kind of conversation with your kids? Listen, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to deal with some stuff that you just don't like, and that's okay. I mean, if you don't have an ox in your barn, you're never going to have to shovel any poop. 
If you don't have an ox in your barn, you're never going to have to deal with that messy stuff. But if you want to harvest, if you want to be successful, if you want to make an impact, you're going to have to deal with some messiness. And when we're talking about in the context of ministry, or we're talking about in the context of relationships, whether we're talking individually or collectively as a church, if we want to produce something good, if we want to make an impact, if we want to make a difference, chances are it's going to get messy. And it's the people who avoid messiness. It's the people who play it safe. Those are the people whose relationships stay shallow. The people who play it safe, the people who avoid messiness in life, those are the people who never get to discover joy of authenticity in their relationships with others. Life is messy. People are messy. Relationships are messy. Church is messy. Over the past few weeks, you've heard me say this. Values times behavior equals culture. No church ever drifts into a fantastic culture. No church, no collection of people ever just drift accidentally into having a great, healthy culture. For us and our church, it means that our values are aligned with and in tuned with Jesus. It means our behavior are aligned with and in tune with his commands. And if we do that, it is an ironclad guarantee. It is a lock. Our culture is going to be like Jesus. If our values are on track with his values, if our behavior is on track with his commands, our culture is going to be like him. We will have a gospel culture. And so our church has adopted eight core values that are shaped by Jesus, shaped by the gospel. And each week we cover two at a time. Today, I'm going to cover two of those values. Here's the first one. Move toward the messes. Nobody makes a difference by staying comfortable. You've experienced that in your own life. Here's the second one. Make generosity normal. We invest our lives, not just our money. Jesus was incredibly generous in how he gave his life away for other people. And there was no mess that was too messy for Jesus to mess with. Now, religious leaders of the day, they did not like that about Jesus. They were mad at Jesus about that. But it was the skeptical, the, the hurting, the irreligious, the curious crowd that they were drawn to that. They loved that about Jesus, and so they wanted to be around him. There was a guy named John. He was probably Jesus' best friend. And John wrote a biography of Jesus' life. He wrote an account of Jesus' life, what happened to him, what he did, and, and his teachings. And, and we know that biography of Jesus' life. It has a title, The Gospel According to John, The Good News According to John. And, and John writes about a time that Jesus got messy. He crossed geographic lines. He crossed, crossed cultural lines. He crossed religious lines. And, and Jesus went head on into something that most people would have said, that's too messy for us. And I'm going to share with you an account from the life of Jesus that you could read about in John chapter 4. I want to encourage you to go back and read that. I'm going to summarize a big chunk of it today. I don't have time to read all of it. So I want you to go back and read John chapter 4. But before we can get into it, I, I want to show you this. This is a map of what Israel looked like during the time of Jesus. And right smack dab in the middle of Israel, there was a region known as Samaria. Jewish people in Jesus' day, Israelites in Jesus' day, they looked down on, they despised Samaritans. They saw them as ethnically and racially impure and inferior. They saw them as religiously impure and inferior because they had taken Judaism, they had mixed it over the years with elements of, of paganism, and they were just despised. As a matter of fact, they were so looked down on, they were so despised. A respectable Jewish person, if they were traveling from this area to this area, they wouldn't walk through Samaria, they would walk around it. I mean, think about that. Going out of your way that much long before, you know, <laughs> public transportation or cars. That, I know haters are going to hate, but that is like next level condescension right there. But Jesus didn't play by those rules. Jesus was here and he had to make his way up to Galilee. And instead of going around, Jesus walked right through Samaria. And on his way walking through Samaria, he got a little tired. He got a little thirsty. And so he stopped at a well on his way. And when he's at this well, there's a, there's a woman 
at the well by herself. And so Jesus begins to talk to her. And what you have to understand is men did not talk to women in public back in Jesus' day. Hold on. That's not exactly true. Men talked to prostitutes in public. But respectable men didn't talk to respectable, respectable women in public. That just wasn't done. That's where Jesus crossed a cultural line. And this woman was a Samaritan woman. She was despised on. She was looked down on. Jesus crossed a religious line. Jesus is being pretty messy here. It's the kind of thing that would make his disciples, his followers, very uncomfortable with this course of action. And Jesus and this unnamed woman are engaged in a conversation. If you go back and read it in John chapter 4, it's going to feel like it's a bit of a prickly conversation. And it's hot and, and they're both thirsty. And Jesus is talking about water. And he's talking about water metaphorically. That he has a water that will cause someone to never thirst again. And this woman, she's just, she's too sweaty. She's too thirsty. She's too tired to really connect with what Jesus is talking about. And so she kind of fires back sarcastically at him by saying this. Sir. Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So Jesus says, okay, go call your husband and come back. Let's just hold it there for a second. This woman asks him a question and he says, go call your husband. <laughs> come back, we'll talk about this. Ladies, imagine with me. You run into me at Costco and we're talking and, and, and things are fine. And, and then you ask me a question about a message that, I'm give, that I've given what would your reaction be if I said, hey, go get your husband and I'll answer that question? Some of you might hit me. I mean, is Jesus being rude? Is Jesus being condescending here? I mean, that just feels a little demeaning. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like the equivalent of Jesus saying, hey, woman, well, go make me a sandwich. It's not comfortable. I want you to hear me. That is not what's going on. Jesus' response, Jesus' statement, go get your husband and come back. Yes. That was painful for her to hear, but it was a million miles away from being unkind, demeaning, or unloving. As a matter of fact, it was the first overture of grace from Jesus to this woman. Let's keep reading. The woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. If you've ever been to a country where people have to walk to collect water on a daily basis, if you've ever been to a country where people have to collect water in jugs and carry it back to their home, you know what a strange thing it is for people to do this on their own. In this culture, it would have been normal, it would have been expected that women would have gone to do this together in the cool part of the day. But here's a woman, she's going to collect water by herself in the hottest part of the day. What's going on? You got to hear me on this. In this culture and in this moment in history in which women depended on men for their security and for their status in society, this woman did not have a man on whom she could rely at this moment in history and in this culture where it was imperative that women stick together, this woman did not even have a friend who would walk to the well with her. She's unwanted. She's ostracized. And in her society, she is considered unworthy. And her white, hot, sting, searing feeling of shame and loneliness is now on full display. You are unwanted. You are unworthy. You are alone. You are at the bottom of your social, the social uh, status in your community. And now it's just on full display. And here's this guy, this stranger at the well say, hey, let's talk about that. What would you do? Well, the thing that she did is most likely the thing that you or I would do. We try to change the subject. But Jesus kept the subject on, the, on track and, and he began to talk to her about who God is and what it means to worship God and to worship him in, in spirit and in truth. And, and here is this man who is talking to her about things about her that he never could have known, that he shouldn't have known. And, and he's talking in a way and, and he's sharing things in a way that's different from anybody that she's ever had any encounter with before. And so she responds by saying something she probably can't even imagine. She probably can't even believe that she's saying this out loud, but she's wondering, could this, could this be what I think it is? And so she says this. She says, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. And, and when he comes, he's going to explain everything 
to us. Now here's this man who's in front of her and he's, he, she's not able to explain how he knows the stuff about her and she's not able to explain how he understands so much about who God is and maybe she's hoping against hope. Could this be the guy that, could this be, is it possible? Is it possible that, that this guy who I'm talking to, is he the Messiah? And then Jesus responds. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I am I don't know if emotionally we can get there. I don't know if emotionally we can relate to what's happening in this moment. But remember, in Jewish society, Samaritans are at the bottom. And in Samaritan society, this woman, because of the messiness of her life, she's at the bottom. And in this moment, Jesus places her at the top At this moment and in this conversation, Jesus gives her the most privileged position in all of humanity at that moment in history. Because in that conversation, to this woman, for the very first time, he lets someone in and he says, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I am God in the flesh and I am here moving towards you. I am God in the flesh and I love and accept you. I am God in the flesh and I am here to pay for the messiness of your life and the messiness of your sin. I'm here to move towards you. And that conversation in that moment was a declaration to this woman and it's also a declaration to us. It's as if Jesus is saying this, whatever, whatever your mess is, it's not too messy for me. And it revolutionized this woman's life. It was amazing. It was astounding to her. She had never experienced anything like this. And she just dropped her stuff and she ran back to her village to tell everyone about the encounter she just had. And this is what it says in John chapter 4. She says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Because of this woman's testimony. Isn't this amazing? Here's a woman, she went from outcast to now the most influential person in her village. Think about that. They believed in Jesus because of this woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Why does it keep repeating? He told me everything I ever did. It's because everything she ever did was a source of her shame. Everything she ever did was the source of her unworthiness, her source of embarrassment. It was the source of why she was outcast in her society. He told me everything I ever did and he doesn't hold it against me. That's part of the good news of the gospel that Jesus knows everything that you ever did. And if you trust in Jesus, if you trust in him, if you give your allegiance, you put your faith in him, he doesn't hold it against you. He would rather take it on himself. He would rather pay the price for the messiness of our sin than hold it against you and hold it against me. That is a story worth sharing. I want you to think about this. God will take your mess and turn it into a message. And that's what happened in the life of this unnamed woman at the well. And that's what can happen in your life and my life and our life, that God will take our mess and turn it into a message. Because of the way that Jesus was with her, because of the way that Jesus is with us, we want to be the kind of people that we move towards the messes in each other's life. We want to be the kind of people we move towards the messes in our community, in our world. We want to be the kind of people who move towards the messes in our relationship with each other. And when we show up, we want to show up with kindness, with grace, and with generosity. And this is motivated by the way that Jesus loved us and because he loved us the way that he did with, with kindness and love and generosity, we want to love others that way, but, but it doesn't really stop there. These values of move towards the messes and, and make generosity normal, they are fused together and motivated by something else. They're fused together and motivated by a promise that Jesus made. I'm about to read to you a promise that Jesus made and it is so unbelievable It's so incredible. It sounds so far-fetched that when I read it, some of you are going to think, ah, that can't be true. You're going to be waiting for something to explain away because it's going to sound so incredible that it just can't be true. Are you ready to hear it? In John chapter 14, Jesus talking to his followers said this, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me will do the work I have been doing and they will do even greater things. They will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. 
Whoever, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever trusts in him, whoever gives their life to him, whoever gives their allegiance to Jesus, they will do even greater things than what Jesus has done. Have you, have you let yourself just be hit by the weight of that, by the gravity of that? If you are in Christ, if you believe in Christ, that you will do even greater things than he did? And if that's true, I think we need to start a class around here on how to turn water into wine. It's pretty great when Jesus did that. I want to be biblical. How about you? Seriously, what does this mean? What does this mean that you and I, if we are in Christ, if we believe in him, that we'll do even greater things than he did? Whenever we find something in the Bible and we're, we're not totally sure that we know what it means, it's always important. Let's, let's zoom out, let's pull back, and let's look at it in context. Now, you don't have to read stuff in context. You can ignore context. If you ignore the context, no one's going to make you read it in context. You're just going to miss out on what the author actually meant. Cable News today loves to ignore, ignore context. Seems like pollsters, not too good at reading things in context. Naive people, fantastic at ignoring context. But you're wise. You're a wise person. And you know that wise people read statements in context, so let's make sure that we understand the fuller context of what Jesus is trying to communicate. To do that, we're going to pull back, and we're going to look at this by going back two chapters to John chapter 12, and we're going to, we're going to understand something he said earlier to better understand this. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servants also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, Jesus used this imagery because it just made sense to the crowd that he was with. Many of them were very agricultural. They were, they were farmers. They would have understood this. When he talks about a seed, you put a seed in the ground and more things grow. He's using that to illustrate a principle. For there to be a fruitful life, there has to be death. For there to be victory, there, there has to be surrender. There has to be an exchange. And Jesus is trying to prepare his listeners. He's trying to prepare his followers for the exchange that, that's coming. That through the cross and through the resurrection, he is going to exchange his life for the lives of those who will trust in him. And you've heard me say this before. This is how we talk about it. This is the great exchange. Jesus took what we deserve so that we can have what he deserves. And this is the gospel. This is what motivates us. And so we want to join Jesus in this. We want to give our lives away. We want to exchange our lives for life change in those who would trust and follow Jesus. This is why we give our lives to something bigger than ourselves. This is gospel motivation. It's not because we're waiting to get more stuff from Jesus, but because of all that he has given to us, we want to give ourselves away so that others can experience it too. So you might be wondering, all right, so how does this help me understand, right? How does this help me understand what Jesus is talking about when he says, you're going to do even greater things? Am I going to, am I going to heal blind people? Am I going to feed thousands? Am I going to be able to do just one miracle? Probably not. I wish that were true, but probably not. Would you think about it like this? Jesus is talking about quantity, not quality. He's talking about quantity, not quality. Jesus isn't saying greater things as in, hey, we're going to raise even more people from the dead than he did. We're going to do even more miraculous things than he did. No, he's talking about impact. As we lay down our lives, as we move towards the messes and we engage in generosity, as we lay down our lives for others and invest in others, we're going to see even more people impacted and changed by the gospel in our lifetime than Jesus saw in his earthly lifetime. Think about that for a second. We get to see more people changed and impacted by the gospel in our lifetime than Jesus saw in his ministry in his earthly lifetime. And do you want to know something? People of Autumn Ridge Church, you are living proof that Jesus' promise is true. Because of your investment, because of the exchange that you make, because of the way that you generously invest in what Jesus is doing, we get to see 
massive numbers of people, their lives impacted and changed by the gospel, more so than Jesus would have ever seen in his lifetime, in his earthly ministry. I want to give you just a snapshot. I wish I had more time. I want to give you just a snapshot of the kind of generosity that is taking place and has been taking place through this church. Did you know 61 missionaries and two mission agencies are supported globally because of this church? 21 organizations are supported and are partnered with locally. You, you don't even know how to put in a number to that, the number of lives that are impacted and changed because of that. Thousands of hours are invested, in, are invested each year by you in serving ministries both inside and outside of this church. Countless expressions, countless expressions of, of generosity through life groups, families, and individuals of, of Autumn Ridge. This week I asked some longtime leaders here at Autumn Ridge to share with me stories of generosity. And, and, and I was just so moved as I read story after story. Don't tell anybody, but I got a little teary-eyed at my desk. because I just kept reading these stories of amazing generosity through this church. There's the Backpack for Kids programs that, that meets hunger needs in our community. There's the Kingdom Garden that this year alone produced over 13 tons of food that was given away to Channel One and Community Food Response. Autumn Ridge uh, generosity is expressed through the uh, Compassion Evangelical Hospital. If you read the article in the Connect newsletter that goes out uh, each week, you might have heard this. Since 2007, over 500,000 patients have been cared for and have heard the gospel. 5% on average meet with a pastor or staff to talk about Jesus. And, and we know that over 200 people have made public professions of faith. And even though a public profession in their country, a public profession of faith in their country puts their lives at risk. That is amazing. You are living proof that Jesus' promise is true. That we get to see even greater numbers of people in our lifetime whose lives are impacted and changed because of the gospel than Jesus saw in his earthly lifetime and in his ministry. But Jesus wants to do even greater things through you and through me. And understanding that, we got that. Let's go back and read this promise from Jesus again. And I want you to notice how he doubles down at the end. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they will do even greater things, greater things than these. Because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This last, these last couple of sentences, this is where people sometimes get tripped up and misunderstand. These are the kind of verses that prosperity gospel con men love to take out of context. These are the kind of verses that confused Bible readers sometimes drift into thinking. They, get, they land at the conclusion, I can ask for anything and God's eventually going to give me whatever it is I ask for. Maybe you've landed at that, con that conclusion too. And, and if you got there, it's because maybe you forgot to read it in context. Every time that this phrase is used in the New Testament, I will do whatever you ask for in my name. I've read every single time that it's used, almost every single time, it's always in the context of asking for wisdom. There's a couple of times that it, it's in the context of asking God to heal relational brokenness inside of the church. But in this context, it's about aligning ourselves with Jesus' agenda. As a matter of fact, if you think about it like this, Jesus invites us to exchange our agenda for his. Your agenda ultimately is what you are aiming for with your life. What are you aiming at with your life? What's the trajectory of your life trying to move you towards? That's your agenda. Jesus' agenda is his glory. Jesus' agenda, and this is what that means, is for people to see him for who he truly is and to value him for who he truly is. That is his agenda, and Jesus will always say yes to that. He will always say yes to any prayer. He will always bless. He will always respond yes in the affirmative to any request for him to be glorified, for his agenda to be pushed forward. And just like the woman at the well, and every single person since, when we see Jesus for who he is and we value him for who he is, it changes our lives. It changes everything. So I'm going to ask you this question. Will you exchange your life for life change? 
Would you exchange your life for life change? Do you believe that Jesus meant when he said, when he promised, you will do even greater things? Do you believe that? If we say yes, if we believe that, what could stop us from investing all of ourselves in his agenda? If we really believe that, what could hold us back? What could ever stand in the way of us investing all of ourselves, our time, our resources, our ability, and even our money? What could stop us from generously investing all of ourselves and his agenda for his glory, for the good of those who would see and value him for who he is? I want you to think about the things that we've talked about in these past few minutes. I want you to think about them in light of our, our base camp passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. These are our theme verses. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is how we've been talking about what it means to be compelled. It's this right here. It's our series thesis. When what you have to do is what you want to do, it feels like what you get to do. What's your experience been like? Are you feeling tension between what you have to do in Christ as a follower of him and what you want to do? Or or are you really discovering, have you discovered the joy of what it's like to say, I know that Jesus says this is what I have to do, but it is what I want to do. It is a privilege to join him and his agenda. This is what we are privileged to do. And the same way that he did it for us, we get to do it for others. Move towards the messes and make generosity normal. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible kindness. You see into the messiness of our lives and you say, I'm not going to hold that against you. Trust in what I give you. And I'll pay the price. God, I pray that we would never lose our sense of joy and gratitude and being humbled by that. God, I pray that you would stoke a fire in us to love others and to move others in that way. God, I pray that you would help us see clearly what it is that we have at our disposal, whether it's our gifts, our abilities, our time, our finances, whatever it is. God, I pray that, that we would discover even greater and greater joy and surrendering those to you for your purpose. We ask you to do with what we offer, what we could never do on our own. God, we pray that we get to see even greater things. We pray that we get to see more and more people, lives changed and impacted by your gospel. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.